Stephen Furtick had an interesting Easter message for his church on Easter Sunday. Also, Carrie Lake has come out in favor of abortion as she is running for Senate in the state of Arizona. And we've got some good news coming out of the University of Georgia as thousands of students there and across the country are worshiping together and getting baptized. Praise God. We've got all of this and more on today's episode of Relatable. It's brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is having a wonderful week so far. Okay, Brie, I said I didn't know if I was going to call on you, and I'm already calling on you two seconds in. (laughs) Right away. Okay, I have an idea for merch, and we can just throw it out here just to see if people like it. Because I say the same thing at the top of every show. Hope you're having a wonderful week so far. Mm -hmm. I think that you could make some kind of cute like trucker hat or rope hat with some kind of cute groovy script that says hope you're having a wonderful week dot 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 or hope you're having a wonderful week so far it's a lot of words but I think it would be kind of cute and kind of happy yeah you think you think dot 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 so far no 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 no. (laughs) okay dot 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 or so far (laughs) or hope you're having a wonderful week without any ellipses Mm -hmm. Yeah, without yeah, yeah. any so far. Those are a little, a little ominous. much, a little yeah. ominous. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what do you mean? Hope you're having a wonderful week. Does that mean something else? Okay, workshop it. No bad ideas in brainstorming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're right. Speaking of merch, we do have some cute merch coming out for Mother's Day mm-hmm. sometime soon. We're gonna have onesies. They're gonna be really cute. Mom, baby matching onesies if you guys have any ideas also specifically for related bro merch let me know because father's day is coming up we got our mother's day stuff coming out we've also got our related bro day uh coming up in june and so we want merch that dads are gonna wear that you're actually gonna like um it's just difficult for us to do it because obviously we are women and Because my dad, my brother, Chief Related Bro, my husband, they all say they don't like a bunch of, like, words on their shirt. It's a little difficult for me to know, like, how exactly to brand it. But even as I'm saying that, I have some ideas. So feel free to message me, comment, links to stuff that you guys do like, and then we can use that as some inspo for some Father's Day merch. All right. Uh, We got some serious stuff to talk about, as we always do. Some stuff that I guess is going to make people very upset because I've noticed over the past several days since we talked about Trump's abortion stance and the video that he put out, we've got some professing, self-identifying conservatives who are very angry that we disagree with Trump on that. They say that I don't want to win elections, that I am being too black and white about this, that Trump is absolutely right, that we have to be more practical, we have to be more pragmatic in order to win elections. We just need a little bit of that baby murder to secure the election, and then finally we will be principled, finally we'll be Christian, finally we'll be anti-murder. Okay, I understand the practical, pragmatic argument here. I really do. And of course, I want Donald Trump to win. As I said, as the dodo brains who took my arguments out of context failed to address, I just disagree with this strategy. I disagree with the strategy on principle. I disagree with the strategy pragmatically, too. Um, And I will explain that as we get into what Carrie Lake said. Carrie Lake recently released a video basically echoing Trump's stance on abortion, this very moderate, sophisticated, pragmatic, pseudo-compassionate stance that we actually need to be much more a middle of the road on abortion. Not only uh, does she make the case that that is necessary to win elections, but it's also the more moral position, which is just absolutely egregious. So here is part of the video that Carrie Lake put out on X the other day. It's SOT1. This total ban on abortion that the Arizona Supreme Court just ruled on is out of line with where the people of this state are. The issue 
is less about banning abortion and more about saving babies. I agree with President Trump. This is such a personal and private issue. I chose life, but I'm not every woman. I want to make sure that every woman who finds herself pregnant has more choices so that she can make that choice that I made. Okay, so that's the, that's the pro-choice, pro-abortion position. She just articulated it. She just put some soft music behind it, and she happens to say that she's a Republican. And so all of a sudden, that is now the pro-life take. The pro-life take among Republicans is to actually be pro-choice and pretty ardently pro-choice. She said it's a personal, private thing. I chose life, but I'm not every other woman. That is exactly what Planned Parenthood believes. That is exactly what every pro-abortion, pro-choice activist has been saying for literally decades. Now, this is the conservative position. This is the anti-abortion position. It's the anti-abortion position to be pro the choice of abortion. We're talking about murdering people. That's what we're talking about. We are talking about the violent poisoning and or dismembering of helpless babies. That's what we're talking about when we're using the soft music with the warm filters to make it seem like we're really thoughtfully, empathetically thinking through this complicated, private, personal issue. We are talking about the murder of people. Okay? We are talking about chopping up babies. There's not much nuance to this, okay? So excuse me if I don't have a lot of patience for your pragmatism. I think that it's evil. All right? Okay, quick pause to tell you about our first sponsor for the day, and that is Range Leather. So even some of the most expensive leather products that you see on the market today are actually really cheaply made overseas, and you think you're getting high-quality, long-lasting leather goods, but you're just not, but you're paying a really high price for it. So if you're going to pay the cost of leather goods, you may as well ensure that what you are getting is truly high quality will last a lifetime and also comes from a company that actually supports your values and they make all of their stuff right here in America that of course is range leather I love this company they're family owned all of their stuff is made in Wyoming they've got amazing hats belts accessories wallets um, purses great for Mother's Day or Father's Day going up there's re- uh, coming up there's really something for everyone and again this is a company that loves God they love America so it's just a win all around I really love their stuff if you go to rangeleather.com slash alley you'll get 15% off all range leather products rangeleather.com slash alley for 15% off rangeleather.com slash alley So her video was in response to a ruling by the Arizona State Supreme Court that allowed an 1864 statute banning abortion to stand. And you'll remember Carrie Lake is a former Arizona governor candidate, and now she is an Arizona Senate candidate. And she wanted to respond to this because she is trying to win that independent vote that, of course, she lost when she ran for governor. Now, can I just be honest about what my take on Carrie Lake has always been? There was one day that we were going to have her on the show and it didn't work out logistically. I don't know. We got wires crossed or something like that. But I was I'm always thankful when candidates or politicians agree to come on the show. I understand they're busy. They get a lot of media requests. And she was kind enough to accept our invitation to come on the show. It didn't end up working out. And um, so I just I'll say that, that I'm thankful for the, I guess, the respect that her team showed us and accepting our request, however long ago that was, maybe a year ago. However, I have never, I have never been a Carrie Lake fan. I just haven't. Do I think that it would have been better for the state of Arizona to have her as the governor versus who they have now? Absolutely. Because the governor now, of course, is far left and absolutely stands for everything that I stand against. And Carrie Lake would have been better on immigration. She probably would have been better on abortion, better on gender, better on a lot of things. But when I look at her history, I don't see any kind of solid history of 
conservatism. And personally, I just, and you can say that this is superficial. You can say, you know, it's shallow, emotional, whatever. I just didn't like her persona. And when she lost, I completely understood why. And this whole gimmick of claiming that it was election fraud, that I'm not saying there's never any funny business going on in elections. You guys know that I understand that that's a definite possibility and even happens, but that she didn't actually lose that whole uh, tear that she went on claiming that um, this was some kind of fraudulent fake election and that really she won. There's no possible way that her opponent could have won fair and square because she was so popular. I'm sorry, no. I I knew immediately that this is someone that wasn't going to appeal to most people in the purple state of Arizona and certainly wasn't going to appeal to a lot of women. Um, It's interesting, and I think that she would probably agree with this, that she's kind of switched a little bit because she had an extremely, as she was running, a very masculine energy, like a very I'm-so-based Carrie Lake energy. And a lot of the male commentators in this space really liked her, always praised her, and just thought that she was so strong, going to be an amazing champion for conservatism. And I just sat back and knew and knew I didn't say anything during the election because, of course, I thought that she'd be a better choice than her opponent. But now I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, I see what she's doing. She realizes that she lost the female vote in Arizona because she was way too aggressive and not in an appealing way at all. And now she is trying to win back those women by pretending to be like, or maybe she really is, I don't know, like this soft, gentle, genteel person and equivocating on something like abortion because she thinks that she is going to ingratiate herself to this group of women. Um, I don't think that it's going to work. And it's for the same reason that I don't think that it's going to work for Donald Trump. I don't believe that there is this group of independents or this group of moderate conservatives or this group of independent conservative or apolitical women who are all just waiting to vote Republican and all just waiting to vote for Donald Trump or waiting to vote for Carrie Lake, who is very much aligned with Donald Trump. But they just need to hear that Carrie Lake and Donald Trump are moderate on abortion, and then they've secured their vote. I'm sorry, no. People who are in that camp that I just described, they don't like Trump, they don't like MAGA, and it's not primarily the abortion issue that's holding them back. And you don't have to agree with them. I don't agree with them on a lot of things. But to those people, they see MAGA and Trump as a unique threat to democracy. They see him as a racist. Uh, They could never tell their friends that they voted for him um, or anyone aligned with him. And they see him as potentially a convicted felon. So there is so much of a stigma surrounding MAGA that these people that Carrie Lake and Donald Trump are trying to appeal to uh, uh, are not going to be effectively swayed by this. They're just not. And so we are losing this battle And it will not help us win the war. I think that's the thought. That's the calculation. We might equivocate on this battle. We'll surrender a little ground. Again, we'll give a little bit of baby murder or maybe a lot of baby murder. I don't know exactly what their stance is. Um, But we will ultimately win the election. We will ultimately win the war. I think that that is strategically foolish. I do not think that that's going to work. I also think that that is going to, and this is what people get mad about. You can get mad all you want to. I think that that is also going to chip away at the enthusiasm of the pro-life Christians who Donald Trump and other Republicans like him need to be um, their evangelists. And be their apologists and be their supporters who will go out and tell other people and convince other people to vote for them. Now, those pro-life Christians will still vote for Donald Trump. I'm still going to vote for Donald Trump uh, because I understand the binary option there. 
and RFK is just not an option for me because he is way too radical on abortion and some other issues. But while those pro-life Christians will vote for Donald Trump and might vote for Carrie Lake, will vote for the most pro-life option, they're going to have a hard time going out amongst their friends and communities and say, yes, it is your moral imperative to vote for this Republican candidate. Because at the end of the day, right now, we're looking at a field of pro-choicers. We're looking at a bunch of evil options when it comes to their abortion position, and we're just trying to decide which one is least evil. And abortion is a big enough issue that this is going to become very morally sticky for a lot of people who tend to vote Republican, a lot of Christians who tend to vote Republican. I just don't think that they are winning anyone over by this position, but you are potentially losing people by this position. And you're certainly losing their enthusiasm by this position, not to mention the fact that it is immoral. Like, we have justified other human rights atrocities not too long ago under the banner of states' rights. Abortion is even worse. Abortion is even more evil. But it belongs in the same category as slavery because it is the objectification and the subjugation, uh, subjugation and the dehumanization of vulnerable, helpless people. And so in the year of our Lord, 2024, as we can look back at history and see exactly what it looks like when we treat a human being as if they are subhuman, when we decide that one group of people does not deserve rights based on how they look, based on what size they are, the abilities that they bring to the table, their innate characteristics. We understand that that kind of mentality leads to um, the systemic and atrocious trampling on the value and the dignity of that group of people. Like we can look at the Holocaust, we can look at slavery, we can look at different conflicts throughout history in which one group of people is dehumanized. And we can see the trouble that that causes, that that doesn't actually lead to some kind of like big picture victory, that that doesn't help lead us to a place of freedom. It just doesn't. It's not a value that you can compromise on and then hope to win God's favor and win the country back. We are not winning if we are losing on the issue of abortion. We're simply not. It's that big. As I've said before, like there are other issues that I am willing to make compromises on, but not on this one. Again, we are talking about human beings. We're not talking primarily about a political issue. We are talking about murder. I don't want murder to be regulated. I want it to be ended. I want it to be banned. When we think about it from the perspective of what an abortion is, what the procedure entails, what it is doing, and whom abortion is actually victimizing, a living, wiggling human being, then there's really no other moral or logical position to take except for, no, this has to be banned. And a baby that is conceived through rape A baby that is conceived through incest is no less a baby. Tell me the difference between a baby that's conceived in rape and a baby that's not. When you're looking at it from the perspective of the victim, from the perspective of the baby, these kinds of exceptions are not only illogical, but yes, also immoral. Another pause for the next sponsor for the day, and that is Preborn. As we are talking about the atrocity of abortion, we have to remember that we have the ability to do everything that we can with our resources, uh, with all that God has given us to try to save as many baby lives as possible. As long as abortion is happening in this country, there will be an opportunity for Christians to stand up and to try to protect those unborn children. You can do that by partnering with Preborn. It's a network of clinics across the country that provide free resources to women, 
families in need with a crisis pregnancy situation that includes a free ultrasound. When a woman sees that baby on the screen, when they hear that beating heart, they are so much more likely to choose life for their child. And when they do, Preborn is there providing them with the things that they need. So if you go to preborn.com slash Allie, you can make a secure donation. Donate $28 if you can. That covers the cost of a free ultrasound, but just give what you can. It can literally save a life. Go to preborn.com slash Allie. And I just want to say one thing about the life of the mother argument that I heard Donald Trump make. Um... Donald Trump said, okay, we have to have compassion and we have to make exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. So I already gave my stance on the rape, incest exceptions. As I've said many times before, I believe that rapists should get the death penalty, not the baby. The pro-choice position is that, and Donald Trump's position, is that babies should be able to get the death penalty um, for a rape that someone else committed. Is that justice? Is that liberty and justice for all? No, it's not. So I'm of the radical extreme position that rapists should get the death penalty, not a baby. The pro-choice position, again, is actually the opposite, that we shouldn't have a death penalty for rapists or even murderers, but we should have the death penalty for babies. I know I'm so crazy that I believe that that is egregious and immoral. Um, But on the life of the mother, there is no reason for abortion to save the life of the mother. Every single pro-life law that exists allows for the removal of ectopic pregnancies. Ectopic pregnancies are not viable. They do have to be removed. We do not consider that as pro-lifers, as Christians, an abortion. You are simply removing a child that did not grow where they have to be growing, in order to survive. And because both the life of the mother and the baby are at risk, we save the life that we can save. So that is the pro-life position, is that we believe that the value of the mother's life is equal to the value of the baby's life. And so when the mother's life is at risk when she is pregnant, we believe in delivering the child. Even if it's early Even if that child has to be put on life support, even if that child has a slim chance of surviving, we believe that if the mother is going to be saved by removing that child from the womb, then the child should be removed. But there is no reason for the child to be killed first. Because either way, early delivery, induced labor, and abortion, the baby's still coming out. There is no medical reason for the baby to be poisoned or dismembered first. If the baby needs to be removed to save the life of the mother, then deliver the baby and do everything you possibly can to save that child, no matter how many weeks gestation that you are. I understand that before 24 weeks gestation, like the odds are very slim. I think the earliest has been 19 weeks, which is super, super, super preemie of a baby being born and actually surviving after being in the NICU for several months. But you do everything that you can. Or even if it's before that, you deliver that child, give them as much care and comfort and dignity as you possibly can. You don't purposely slaughter them. There is no reason to slaughter a child to save the life of a mother. Again, the option is delivery. So even that is just like a crazy position to take. It's a pro-choice position to take, okay? And it's evil because, again, we are talking about babies. One of the few people that seems to understand the inconsistency, the incongruence in this position of like, oh yeah, we're pro-life, but maybe we'll just ban it at 15 weeks. Oh yeah, we're pro-life, but maybe we'll just allow the abortion pill to be on the market. Oh yeah, we're pro-life, but in cases of rape and incest, it's totally fine. Um, It's Bill Maher. Bill Maher, he is a liberal. He's got some sanity, though, and I appreciate that. I still think he's a liberal at the end of the day, probably doesn't like people like me, sees my views as dangerous. But at least he honestly seems to understand the logic of the pro-life position. So here he is breaking it down in a way that I would say most Republicans probably can't. That's why I don't understand the 15-week thing. 
or the Trump's plan is, let's leave it to the states. You mean, so killing babies is okay in some states? Like, I can respect the, the absolutist position. I really can. I, I, I scold the left on when they say, oh, you know what? They just hate women, people who aren't pro-life, they, pro-choice. They just, they don't hate women. They just made that up. They think it's murder. And it kind of is. I'm just okay with that. Well, at least he's honest. He is honest not only about the pro-life position, but he is also honest about the pro-abortion position. And I wish more pro-abortion people would just be honest that we are talking about being pro-murder of babies versus anti-murder of babies. But he's got some conviction for the people who say that they are on the pro-life side. He is checking our argument there. If we really believe that abortion is murder, as we've always said, if we really believe that life starts at conception, then how can we say that we would be okay with a 15-week ban? How can we be okay with exceptions for rape and incest? If we really believe that abortion is murdering a baby, then how can we be on board with those things in the name of quote-unquote winning elections, which again, I don't think that that's going to help. We can't, unless we're just giant hypocrites, right? And then I also appreciate that as awful as it is, he is honest about the fact that to be pro-choice, you just have to be okay with murder. He goes on to say that the world is overpopulated anyway, and well, we won't miss you, so he's fine with some baby murder. Again, that's heinous. But as, at least he's honest about that. And I wish more pro-choicers would just be honest, like you are okay with legalizing some murder. Enough with the silly nonsense and the euphemisms about clumps of cells, and it's not really a human yet until X, Y, Z. That's all arbitrary, philosophical, just absolute hogwash. You're okay with murdering some humans at some points. And I don't know what your reasoning is for that. You need to decide that for yourself. But you just need to have a moment of honesty that if you believe in abortion exceptions, that you are okay with murder sometimes. You're okay with murdering babies sometimes. You think that it, it should be legal. It should be an option on the table. I'm just not on board with that. Even if it were to win us elections, I'm just not on board with that. I also want to just like point out that Carrie Lake's position has changed on this. Um, During remarks delivered at the American Leadership Forum in 2022, Carrie Lake had previously referred to a great law that Arizona had on the books as she discussed her hope that Roe v. Wade would soon be um, overturned. And I have a clip. I'm not going to play the clip, actually. Uh, But she basically says, it's great. I hope Roe v. Wade is overturned. Well, Roe v. Wade was overturned, and she doesn't think it's so great because now she's running for Senate. It's a different election. She realizes what she possibly did wrong um, when she was running for governor, and she's going back. Typical politician. This is just this is just what they do. Um, it's also interesting that Donald Trump is jumping on this uh, yet again by saying that Arizona just went too far in their abortion ruling. He said— um, approving an inappropriate law from 1864. So this is just left-wing speak because this is what progressives also do when the Supreme Court rules in a way that they don't like. Conservatives are supposed to say, well, the Supreme Court is just supposed to interpret the law based on the Constitution. And we can agree or disagree with that interpretation, but saying like they went too far or that it was inappropriate, that's not really precise language that isn't really typically how conservatives are supposed to talk when it comes to Supreme Court rulings. But he says the Supreme Court in Arizona went too far on their abortion ruling, enacting and approving an inappropriate law from 1864. So now the governor and the Arizona legislature must use heart, common sense and act immediately to remedy what has happened. Remember, it is now up to the states and the goodwill of those that represent the people. We must ideally have the three exceptions for rape, incest, life, and the mother. This is important. Democrats are the extremists. Uh, They support abortion up to the moment of birth and even execution of babies. In some cases, after birth, this should not be. Arizona legislature, please act as fast as possible. Okay. Okay. 
I don't understand what Democrats have to do with this. If this is a law that is protecting as many babies as possible, what do Democrats have to do with it? Shouldn't we just be happy about that as pro-lifers? Like, why are we criticizing any kind of pro-life law going into place and trying to do everything we can to carve out exceptions to make sure that thousands and thousands of babies now fit through a, a loophole to be murdered? It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me. It's just posturing, again, to get those really, I think, non-existent votes. Um, now, again, I will say, like, am I— um, Am I going to support Trump over Biden or RFK? Yeah, I hate that these are the options that we have, but they're what we've got. And of course, there are other issues in addition to abortion. I think none is important as abortion, but there are other issues. Yes. Do I wish that Trump was the head of our foreign policy right now instead of Biden? We're looking at the mess that his weak foreign policy has gotten us into when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Iran. Uh, Of course, I think that Trump will surround himself with a better administration. I think that he will sign pro-life laws, probably, or bills that come across his desk. Um, I think that we're going to have a better economy with Donald Trump. All of that is absolutely true. I think that he is going to generally support the pro-life cause, I think that that's true. That doesn't mean that I have to pretend that I don't have serious disagreements with this position. I mean, politicians come and go. Leadership comes and goes. Like, I am going to live probably long after Trump dies. I have to exist in this country long after Trump dies. So do my children. So do my grandchildren. So I'm thinking um, through the long game. And I'm thinking about what kind of country I want to live in. And I understand, oh, we're not going to have a country if Donald Trump doesn't win. Okay. Again, I don't think compromising on this fundamental issue is the way to ensure that victory. I just don't. I just don't. Okay. Let me tell you about Birch gold. There's a very common sense reason that gold is pushing to all-time highs right now. Actually, there are a lot of reasons, and Birch Gold wants you to know about them. The cost of goods continues to rise. I don't have to tell you that. You're seeing it every time you go into the grocery store or shop on Amazon, despite interest rate controls by the Fed. The national debt continues to skyrocket, now above $34 trillion, causing a lot of people to understandably worry about when the house of cards will come crashing down. A presidential election year will have massive implications on the future of this country. All of this adds up to instability, uncertainty, and that's why so many Americans are turning to Birch Gold to diversify their savings. You can secure a portion of them with gold from Birch Gold. All you have to do is text Ally to 989-898. They'll send you a no obligation free info kit so you can learn more about how to secure a portion of your savings and they will answer all the questions that you have. Just text Ally to 989-898. All right, let's get into Stephen Furtick. <laughs> There's a lot that we could talk about. Okay, yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get to both of the other subjects that we have because they're gonna be kind of quick. So I'm gonna talk about Stephen Furtick and just comment. I just want to comment on something um, that he said or part of his sermon from Easter Sunday. It's just important for us to remember what false teaching can sound like and look like. It's not always someone saying something that is blatantly false. It is also a pastor reaching for meaning in scripture that simply does not exist and making sermons about us or about him rather than about the God who inspired it. So here is Stephen Furtick on Easter. And they're standing in a grave. But the angel says, go to Galilee. And they can't stay at the grave because he's not there. Somebody say, he's not here. He's not not in this depression. He's not in this giving up. He's not in this failure. He's not in, I mean, he's in it to help me, but he's not in it to leave me. He's calling me forward to Galilee. Okay. Can we just like say for a second, Brie, we just comment real fast on the sweater. 
<laughs> I know it's superficial and it's beside the point. There's a lot mm. there's a lot going on here. Much yeah. bigger issues. But this sweater, which I I just <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Is it salmon? Is it pink? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, um a- I'm not sure. I don't know. Um but it <laughs> was $2000. Yeah, it sure was. It was $2000 <laughs> to look like that. Mm-hmm. To look like a little doily. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know that y'all are going to some people aren't going to be happy that we criticized his fashion. I'm sorry when you wear a $2000 grandma sweater on easter <laughs> sunday and you talk about it he talks about it in his sermon because he has to yeah then of course you are inviting people to comment on it that's why you're wearing it you could wear anything i actually do think that we talked about with preachers and sneakers like i actually do think it's an important issue to talk about i do think that a pastor should be understated i don't think it has to be ugly i don't think it has to be frumpy i don't even think it has to be cheap but i do think that whatever a pastor wears should communicate i don't want you looking at me this is not about me this is about the word that is being preached i do think that when mike todd or when stephen furtick or when td jakes are going out there and they are purposely wearing items that say look at me i actually think that you are violating god's call to modesty because when we see that women and men are called to modesty uh, in scripture that we are being called not just to like covering up certain parts of our body, but that we are being called to dignity, that we are being called to humility. And so in anything that we wear, whether we are deciding how much skin to show or deciding like what kind of brand to wear, things like that, we should be looking at ourselves and saying, what am I communicating? Am I communicating vanity? Am I communicating arrogance? Am I communicating, yes, look at me think highly of me, be envious of me, or are we simply adorning the temple that God has given us in respect and dignity and humility? Um, So, and you know what? We can't figure out someone's heart. We can't discern, but I think it's pretty easy to see when someone is intentionally flashy what they are trying, and when they talk about it, what they are trying to communicate. Okay, so what is my problem with this clip? This clip is from a sermon titled I'm Somewhere in Between. So this is called, um, there are a couple of different words for it. This is called eisegesis. We've talked about this before. We actually talked about it with Paul Pitts. Exegesis is when you pull meaning out of scripture based on what the verses actually say and the context, not just the context of scripture. So the surrounding verses, the entire book and the entirety of scripture, but also the historical context. And yes, even the cultural context where it's relevant. Um, You pull meaning out of scripture using these tools, using this kind of contextual understanding. You do the best that you possibly can to pull the meaning out of scripture that is right there. I said Jesus is inserting meaning into scripture. So I want to make a point. I am going to decontextualize a verse and place the meaning that I want to communicate onto that verse. So that is what is going on here. The story of Easter, the story of the tomb rolling away is not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us being in this liminal in-between space and God is taking us to greater heights and making us bigger and better than we were before. Our drab, dreary past is being shaken off as God is promising us riches and success or whatever it is. And I know that I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but that is the message that is being conveyed. The story isn't about us. It is for us. It is not about us. Scripture is not about us. And that is really the theme that you will see in most of Furtick's sermons, is that it is about you. It is about me. It is about our feelings. It is about our story. It is about our failures. It is about our success. It is about what God can give us. And that is not what scripture is about. That is not what the gospel is about. Scripture, the gospel, is about Jesus. So whenever we are expositing scripture, 
reading scripture, preaching scripture, teaching scripture, understanding scripture, and we are pulling the meaning out of the text, using scripture to interpret scripture, using all the context that we have available, what we know about God as revealed in his word. As we are exegeting scripture, we are primarily looking to answer the question, what does this tell me about God? What does this reveal about his character? What is God doing in this? That's not the only thing. There are things to be revealed about human nature, about how the world works. And there are certainly principles to apply to us in scripture. There are sins that we may need to repent of. There are misunderstandings that we may need to correct. There are maybe wrongs that need to be righted either in our lives or in our minds. We need to keep our theology in check. So obviously there are things that we take from scripture, but through the lens of this is God's word talking about God. Jesus is the star of the show. This is for me, but this is not about me. It's a problem when you see preachers start using every story in the Bible, which are real historical stories that really happened as metaphors for your life or your trajectory or your journey. Jesus' resurrection is not a metaphor for you in your life. It's real. It actually happened. It reveals to us the power of God. What does it say about God? It means that death could not hold him. It means that Jesus conquered death on our behalf so we can also experience a resurrection of the body, so we can also experience new life in Christ, so we through Christ can defeat death and live with God forever. Wow, how amazing is God that we didn't deserve any of that. We didn't earn any of that, that while we were still dead in our sin, That in love, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2. How amazing is it that God raised Christ from the dead, setting him apart from every other uh, prophet, so-called at the time, who also claimed to be God. None of those guys raised from the dead. And I'm not saying that everything that... Stephen Furtick said in his sermon was untrue or unhelpful. He might have said some biblical truths. And here's the thing about Stephen Furtick, knowing his background. Stephen Furtick knows biblical truth. I think he could tell you the gospel if you asked him the gospel. I don't think he's stupid. I think he absolutely knows what exegesis is. I think he knows what it would look like to properly handle the word. And maybe there was a time in his career when he was more solid, but sermon after sermon, it's not just eisegesis, it's narcissus. And I didn't come up with that term. That's a term that's been floating around for a while. Narcissus, when you not only read meaning into the text, but you are reading you into the text and you are centering yourself. And it just creates for such bad theology because again, you're reading everything metaphorically that's meant to be literal. You're reading yourself into the text where you do not belong. And you are also starting to try to see everything very mystically, almost as every verse being some special sign that God is telling you about your specific circumstance, like a fortune cookie. That's not a proper or responsible or helpful or sanctifying way to read the word of God. It's not going to lead you more into who God is, and therefore it's not going to help you Uh, live a more holy life. It's not going to give you long-term joy and satisfaction because it's basically sending you the same place as the new age is sending all of its adherents further into yourself. It's basically a Christianized version of the new age self-love, self-help message is that you have a little God, a divine being inside yourself that you just need to journey to. And once you find her, this inner goddess, you can release her, liberate her, and finally all of your dreams will come true. That's not the gospel. Jesus said, we will have trouble, but take heart, not it'll get easier, not we'll finally get everything that we want, not you'll end up succeeding, but he has overcome the world. (music) 
All right, let me tell you about balance of nature. If you're like me and you struggle to get fruits and vegetables, enough fruits and vegetables into your diet on an everyday basis, you might need a little help. And that help can come in the form of supplements from balance of nature. They have a proprietary blend of 31 fruits and vegetables and easy to swallow capsules that give your body so much of the nourishment that it needs. I think most of us have the same problem as much as we would like to say that we are eating enough fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. It's just tough to do, plus getting all of the protein and the fat you need. So just make it easier on yourself. You will probably see a really big positive difference in your health when you do. Go to balanceofnature.com. You'll get 35% off plus $10 off any additional sets with your first order. Just use my code Allie. It's balanceofnature.com, code Allie. There's that C.S. Lewis quote um, that I paraphrased the other day. I love this quote. It's from Mere Christianity. If you haven't read Mere Christianity, you need to. This is how he describes the gospel. Um, This is how he describes that transaction that Jesus presents to us, the exchange that he presents to us. Lose yourself and you will find yourself die to yourself and you will live. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him find everything else thrown in. So Jesus promises not that we will get everything that we want not that we are going to become a better version of ourselves. He actually promises promises us himself and promises us a new self that we will become a new creation. This is another, I am sorry, I love mere Christianity. This is another quote from mere Christianity that reminds me of all of this. God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on gas and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it is not there. And that's what this kind of Narsa Jesus reminds me of is trying to find a happiness apart from God himself. We see Jesus as just kind of some genie that if we read scripture at just the right time in just the right way and look for all the right Easter eggs in the Easter story, all the right fortune cookies, then maybe the combination of all of these things will give us the ingredients for success. And that's just not how it works. We are told over and over again in the New Testament that we will be persecuted. Um, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All In some way or another, we will all have to give up. We will all have to deny ourselves. We will all have to count the cost. We will all go through trials. We will all go through tribulation. We will all go through seasons of slander and ridicule and marginalization. Like that's part of the package. And we give up our ego. We give up our selfish ambition. That doesn't mean that we're all taking vows of poverty. That doesn't mean that we don't have seasons of total abundance and happiness and joy, but those are not the gift or the goal. The gift and the goal is Christ. And so every sermon, every Bible study, every devotional, every time we read scripture, that is our focus. And if you watch Stephen Furtick, if you watch Mike Todd, if you watch Joel Osteen, if you watch TV Jakes, if you watch Joyce Meyer, all of these false teachers are prosperity gospel teachers that say, if you do these things just the right way, God will give you the blessing that you're longing for. God might do that, but it is because of his grace, not because you've earned it. And he also might not. 
that's bad theology that leads you to a very devastating place of feeling like you have been betrayed by God when God cannot, by his nature, betray you because he never promised you all of those blessings. He never promised you the promotion or the riches or the health or the wealth. He never promised you those things. He promised you himself. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect through weakness. Um, And so let us remove ourselves. Let us remove the uh, lens of narcissism when we are reading scripture, reading a book, or really like doing anything. That is like the self-help, self-love, narcissistic world that is being fed to especially us women on a daily basis. It makes us feel like we are our own saviors and our own sufficiency, our own enoughness, that our self-love is enough to buoy us forever on the sea of happiness. It's just not. We need Christ, less of ourselves, more of Christ. We don't need to focus at all on how much or how highly we think of ourselves. We need to enter into self-forgetfulness, not self-loathing, but self-forgetfulness and ask to be filled more and more with Christ. And properly reading his word, sitting under sound teaching is going to help um, get us there. And Stephen Furtick is, is, he's not, he's not a, he's not a sound teacher. Um, I did, I think I posted something on Instagram not that long ago, criticizing them for not saying resurrection or blood of Jesus when it comes to their Easter marketing. I ended up taking that down because it, I think that the conversation actually that was going around that everyone had been commenting on and saying, oh my gosh, see Elevation Church won't even say resurrection or blood of Christ. Um, That's so awful. Even though I do think that Elevation, unfortunately, is led by someone who doesn't handle the word of God well, that was like a copywriter saying that specifically about like the promotional materials that they're putting out to try to invite people to church. And the reason I'm even mentioning that now is because I want you to know that like I take these kind of critiques seriously and I want to make sure that I am being as fair as possible, even when I really disagree and think someone is dangerous. And so I'm not just picking on Stephen Furtick because I'm looking for something to criticize. Like there is someone out there who has, like I did at one point, who has bought into kind of thinking that he and this kind of messaging is right on and it's not. Um, But I also just want to say like, there is grace for where people are in their journey because while I was a Christian, a real believing Christian, I listened to him and all kind of prosperity preachers thinking that it was fine. It took time. It took the Holy Spirit. It took reading God's word. It took my ESV study Bible. It took friends. It took solid churches for me to realize, oh, that's not the gospel. Okay. So we have to have grace for where people are too. And so I want you to hear it from that perspective as well. All right, last announcement before we head out. I want to tell you about a documentary that has been released by Blaze TV. It is incredible, disturbing, but incredible and very important. And it's called Bought and Paid For. If you've ever wondered exactly how it is that our politicians enter public service making, you know, a meager amount of money, they're not worth that much, and then leave public service 20, 30 years later, multi millionaires, then this documentary is for you. It answers all of those questions. This is the way, the nasty way to get rich in the United States. And if you want to know the behind the scenes of how exactly that all works, then you need to watch this. It's called Bought and Paid for How Politicians Get filthy rich and hopefully this will hold people accountable and inspire enough enough ire and frustration in us to try to do something about this go to allyoriginals.com you can use code allyoriginals for $30 off you'll have access to all of blaze tv uh, blaze tv's original documentaries allyoriginals.com with code allyoriginals All right. I've got some good news. I got some good, good news. And no, it's not that I am giving away a bunch of Stephen Furtick um, $2,000 sweaters. I got better news than that. Um, Wait, I have to read this by the Babylon Bee. This is funny. 
Uh, this is a headline from the other day. It says, Stephen Furtick debuts new line of chastity wear. Chastity wear. Guard your virginity forever. Wow. It's because it's an ugly sweater. That's the joke. Um, Babylon B. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even mention Brie. I forgot to mention. I'm popping all over the place right now. But how mad Carrie Lake was about the Babylon B. Did we include that no. in this document? No, we didn't, actually. Oh. But, yeah. Well, yeah. The Babylon B. <laughs> tweeted something just making fun of Carrie Lake um, and her, like, incongruent, illogical position. And Carrie Lake War Room account got so mad about that. They you said, never this argue with satire. satire. What did you say? That's what they said. They said, this isn't real satire. Yeah, they said, this is not valid satire. Yeah. It's valid satire because it hurts my feelings. Mm -hmm. The headline was, Carrie Lake announces plan to lose another election, but this time while supporting baby murder. Woo! Yeah, this is winning. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not tired of winning yet. Yay. Yeah, they got super mad about that. I think I saw a Chesterton quote flo floating around. Maybe Kyle Mann tweeted it. It was like, uh, a man a man gets angry at slander because it is false. He gets angry at satire because it's true. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Good news coming out of the University of Georgia. So Unite Georgia, this is according to Fox News, and we've got a picture to put up. Unite Georgia brought together thousands of Gen Zers for worship, prayer, and personal testimonies at the University of Georgia just the other day. Some students were so moved by the prayer service that they decided to get baptized in the beds of pickup trucks nearby. Amazing. Unite's founder, uh, Tanya Pruitt, and Nate Kearns, who was baptized at the event, both appeared on Fox News' Ingram Angle over the weekend. Uh, Kearns is a junior at UGA and said, I just heard the call from the Lord. And he said, be obedient. I listened to him to take a step of faith and let my fraternity brothers watch that. Um, and so apparently there were lots of baptisms at the University of Georgia. Thousands of the students, again, were worshiping together, singing. Um, so just incredible. And apparently this is happening at a bunch of campuses across the country. I don't know anything actually about this particular organization, but I love seeing students worship together. Praise God. And I just pray that this is something that is a spark that is lighting other campuses aflame with fervor and love for the Lord and that lives are truly transformed by that. So praise God. That's really good news. And remember, God's work doesn't always make headlines and he is always on the move, always changing hearts and minds, exchanging hearts of stone for a heart of flesh. Um, so praise God for that. I pray that he would continue to do that. And he will, he will, because remember his eternal plan of redemption is always going off without a hitch, no matter what we see in the news on social media, God is always doing exactly what he wills and Jesus will claim victory once and for all. All right. That's all we've got for today. We will be back here tomorrow with a, an awesome, Wellness Wednesday episode that I'm super excited about. See you guys then.